Hey friends, it's Uskut, and it's really, really great to be back on here with all of you again. Some of you might remember that in the last creative session, I showed you how to make a really big and detailed piece of artwork, but in a very specific art style. So for today's session, I thought that I might switch gears a little bit and show you a way to practice a workflow that's gonna let you try things out in multiple different styles every time you attempt it. So yeah, for today's video, I'm gonna show you how to make this infographic. I've been making infographic content for a few different businesses over the years, from training providers to other companies that need it for workplace health and safety or even aged care facilities. There's a lot of different use cases for these. And if you look hard enough, they're kind of floating all over the internet. Infographics are eye-catching illustrations that usually help convey pretty simple information, but in very quick succession. It gives you all of the relevant details about something in a nice bite-sized little package. Now I've chosen infographics as the subject for today for a very specific reason. Back when I was studying at university, graphic design was touched on a little bit as one of our subjects, but it wasn't really the forefront of what I was studying. That said, when I left uni and went out into the business world, a lot of people were asking me to do graphic design work. And while I was able to pull that off to some extent by making the odd logo or t-shirt design here and there, it's not something that I consistently practice, and therefore it wasn't something I was particularly good at either. Eventually, I landed a job that required me to make loads of different infographics in quick succession. I found that my graphic design skills improved drastically in a short amount of time, and I really put that down to creating tons of different styles of artwork every single day, with a clear goal and end date in mind. I think if you apply yourself to this method and try and design maybe five or six infographics about interests that you have, you'll be able to chop up those different styles and use them throughout your portfolio and build a really consistent body of work really, really quickly. Not only that, but it will push you to try things within certain constraints, which is pretty much part and parcel of landing any graphic design job. Your first few might come off as a little rough, but over time you'll start to push your own boundaries and you might be really surprised with what you can come up with. So just before we dive into the tutorial, we need to talk about coming up with the script or the main skeleton of your infographic. And there are some really quick steps that you can follow in order to produce something like this. My infographic in particular focuses on modular synthesis, which is something that I'm really, really interested in and therefore it made it really fun and easy to work on. You should pick a hobby or an interest that is relevant to you. That way you'll probably find that you're more likely to stick the project through to the end. I myself like modular synthesis so much that I even have a second YouTube channel that focuses predominantly on music production and I use modular synthesis in that. If you want to know more about it, you're probably not going to get that from this video, but feel free to go and check out my second channel if you're interested. Anyways, the best way to write an infographic is to start writing down some questions first. I wanted to show my viewers what modular synthesis is, so I came up with these basic questions. What is modular synthesis? How does the modular synth differ to other synthesizers? List some types of modules commonly used in modular synthesis. What are some different formats modular synthesis comes in? From there, you should try to answer those questions to the best of your ability or source information through books or the internet. Try to write at least one to two sentences or paragraphs on each of your questions and pretty soon you'll have the whole skeleton of your infographic planned out and you've just got to piece each paragraph together so that it all makes sense. So now that all the boring wordy stuff is out of the way, we can finally get started with the creative process and jump into Affinity Designer. Just a quick note, you might find throughout this video that I interrupt occasionally just to sort of dive a little bit deeper into a topic that I might have glossed over during the time lapse. I hope that these little interruptions provide a little bit more value to what you're getting out of this tutorial. 
If you find you get something out of this tutorial or have any questions, hit the like button and make sure to leave a comment down below and I'll check back in periodically to read through them. Alternatively, I've got loads of other Affinity tutorials over on my art channel and I've got loads of music tutorials on my music channel. So feel free to check those out if you want to. So I just want to talk a little bit about setting up for the project. Given the fact that you can make an infographic in any size that you want, the page width and height don't matter too much. However, I'd recommend giving yourself, you know, at least a thousand pixels in width, just so that you're not losing any detail in the resolution. You can always change this later, but it's good to keep in mind. Something else to consider is the color tab. Mine is set to RGB 8 because I know that this is probably only ever going to be viewed on a screen. However, some clients that I've worked with in the past like to print these things out. So for that, you might want to work in CMYK if they're aiming to have these printed in like a booklet or something. A good rule of thumb is CMYK for print and RGB for screens. At the end of the day, you can always change this later. However, you might find that there's some color variation um, popping out when you do switch later on. Now, something else to consider as well is uh, I'm just going to draw like a couple of different shapes on here just so that we have something to look at. As I work through this infographic, I have a lot of text that I keep adding to it. And obviously the infographic grows in size. So you need to know how to change your document size after the fact. One way you can do this is by going to document setup and then under dimensions, we can see that we can actually just change the height and width here. Now by default, yours might actually be set to rescale. So for example, if I take the height here and I'm just going to put times two and press enter and then okay, we can see that it's actually warped our image as well as made the document wider. So what we really wanna do is go into document setup and we want to anchor all objects to the page. So we'll click anchor to page, and then you want to choose where you want your anchor to be. So for example, if I were to choose the bottom left corner here, it's going to grow from this point outwards. So obviously I want to choose the top middle, we'll say anchor to page, and then we'll select the height and go times two, enter and okay. And now our objects have stayed exactly how they were and the height of the document has grown. So first things first, we need to design a really eye-catching title. The vision I had in mind for this was to recreate what looked like a Eurorack synthesizer and use the front panels of each of the modules to spell out the title, Modular Synthesis. To make sure that I had all the size and scale of everything correct, I started blocking out the basic shapes for each of the letters to appear on. Then I started to change the shape and position of some of these letters. Now I could have gone in and drawn all of these by hand, but just to keep things simple, I decided to just scroll through a bunch of different fonts that I had and pick ones that I thought were appropriate. Given the fact that modules can be uh, like different widths, it sort of made it useful to have some letters on their own on a module and other letters be connected. Then I just started changing some of the colors of the panels. I knew that I wanted some of the letters to appear as if they were on a screen that was like embedded into the panel. So I used some like old digital clock display font for that. Other letters are going to look like they're either printed on there subtly. And then letters like the O here, I've incorporated into the actual design of the module that it's appearing on. Some of this might seem a little bit weird to watch if you're not familiar with the look and feel of modular synthesizers, but I do want it to be a fairly easy to read title while still looking like it is involved in the subject matter. Now that we have the general shape down for everything, it's time to go ahead and start adding in some of the more detailed objects. Each of these modules is attached to a rail um, using a screw. So we need to draw the screws in. For the screws, I'm just using a circle with a little cross shape on the front of it. But there are other little things to keep in mind when designing stuff like this, like adding in gradients or an inner shadow into the middle just to make it look like it's got a bit of depth. And then an outer shadow to make it look like the screws are raised slightly higher than the module itself. 
Now, these things are really tiny in the grand scheme of things, but when you start adding in lots of little details like this and really putting a lot of care into like each and everything that you make, um, it all comes together and really sort of starts adding onto the picture in a pretty important way. I could have quite easily left the screws out or just done a very basic vector shape. Um, but the fact that there is detail in there, when we go in in the end and start doing like a lot of color correction and high pass techniques and up in the contrast and whatnot, little things like this really help the image stand out. Now, I just want to interrupt here again and talk a little bit about how I've made the screws because they're a really good introduction to the quick effects that I'm using throughout the creation of this document. We're going to draw a circle. We're just going to draw a rectangle somewhere inside of that and center it. We'll change the color so that's visible. Control J to duplicate it, turn it on its side. And then with both of those rectangles selected, we use the add feature at the top here. Now, what I like to do is in the quick effects panel, we have all of these different options that are available to us. We're gonna use inner shadow for this first one and just increase the radius. We can see that there's a shadow appearing on the inside of this object, giving the illusion of depth. You can up the opacity if you want, but I find if you do it too much, it just looks a little weird. So we'll just dial it back some. Then we can go ahead and select our circle at the back here. I'm gonna press G on my keyboard for gradient and from the center, draw a line to the outside. Then we'll switch the type of gradient to radial. And now we've got this little slider in the middle here, which allows more color from one side to the other. So we're actually gonna move this over towards the edge. So that it just looks like there's a little bit of drop off in this shape. Now also with this circle selected, we can go into quick effects and I'm gonna use the 3D tool here. We can see that it's given a highlight on one side and a shadow on the other, but it's made the top look really flat. So what we wanna do is increase the radius of this as well something to about there, and then you can play around with the opacity to get the effect that you're after. Finally, I like to use an outer shadow on this as well, which is essentially just a drop shadow. We'll increase the radius, and then we can use the offset tool to sort of move this over to one side. So I'm just gonna shift it down a little bit, but given the fact that we have a highlight on the top right here, we're going to change the angle so that it's on the bottom left. So yeah, maybe something like that. So I know that this is super basic and doesn't really seem like much in the grand scheme of things, but once you start applying effects like these to pretty much everything that you create, you wind up with an absurd amount of detail um, that's really easily achievable. And it all adds up at the end of the day and just gives a much better looking result than having a flat vector graphic, unless that's the style that you're going for. Something else I did with each of the front panels, uh, just to sort of separate them a little bit more, is applying the 3D effect using the uh, layer effects panel. This helps to add a shadow on one side of the module and a raised highlight on the other side, giving it a impression that there is a gap in between each of these and they're sort of sticking out slightly. You might see throughout this entire process that I actually use the 3D effect quite a lot. In the past, when I've done vector work, I often add these shadows and highlights in myself, and it can be quite tedious and time consuming, but this 3D effect gives more or less the same effect for what I'm going for. Um, and it's usually just activated with the click of a button. And I absolutely love that. From there, I needed to make some 3.5 millimeter jacks for cables to slot into. Um, every module is usually covered in these. So I made a couple of different variants. One is just like a basic jack and another is a jack with like a little nut around the edge of it. I'm using a lot of drop shadows, inner shadows, uh, highlights and gradient techniques to help bring these things to life. Now I needed to design a few knobs. I'd already made a set of white knobs, but some modules have like multiple different knobs and different styles of knobs on them. So I made some tinier little knobs. They don't really look like much when you zoom out, but they're sort of a little rougher around the edges. And then I made some of these sort of hexagonal knobs, which um, they can appear on some modules. And I know that they're quite glossy. So we applied different effects to them using the 3D effect and gradient effects just to sort of help 
help them stand out. And cool, at this stage, most of the work had been done. Like I had the general overview with what this title was gonna look like. It might not be the easiest thing to read on earth, but the words are there. And um, yeah, I was having a lot of fun at this point. So I just kept going at it. Now, something else that we needed to do with these knobs is to make them stand off of the panels a little bit more because obviously they're at a higher elevation than the panel they're sitting on. You could use a drop shadow effect for this, but given the fact that they're knobs and they're um, cylindrical, I found it easier just to draw a rectangular shape and add in a gradient, set it to multiply using the blend modes and um, fade it out slightly. This gave the impression that there was a constant light source and that each knob was sticking out off the surface a little bit. Next up, I needed to make the screens that I had on some of these modules look a little bit more realistic. I wanted some scan lines in there, so I just drew in a bunch of boxes and then grouped them together and used some of the vector warp tools to help sort of shift them out a little bit and give it like an old TV screen effect. Then I use mask gradients and blend modes to sort of help get it into the shape and style that I wanted. Using the outer glow effects in the Layers panel also helps the um, screen sort of look a little bit more like a screen because the letter is glowing. Finally, I wanted to give some of these panels a little bit of texture, um, just to sort of make it look like they were made up of different materials. So using the stock panel, I typed in like different metallic textures and brought them in. Now you could just throw these on on top and apply things like multiply or overlay. I found it best to bring them in and sort of play around with their colors a little bit using curves. Sometimes I'm turning them black and white, play around with the blend modes and then sort of blend them in by like dropping shadows or highlights in certain places. I didn't want this effect to be like too visible, um, just enough there to sort of make each module look like it was made of a different material. I just want to talk quickly about the panels that I'm making here for these modular systems. So I'm just going to draw a shape with a random color. We'll go to quick effects and use 3D again. And we'll just increase the radius of this just a little bit so it's more visible and up the opacity. So great, we've got that 3D effect. It looks like this has a little bit of depth to it. But if we select this again and go into 3D, we actually have a lot more options available to us by pressing this little icon up here. So now we've got a lot of different layer effects and we're in 3D. So we can see that we can actually change the direction of the 3D effect. And we've got a lot of options that you'd find in a lot of other 3D applications like Blender and Maya and whatnot. So yeah, we can play around with the diffuse lighting, the specular, which is definitely going to give you more shine on the actual 3D side of things as well. And yeah, the shininess just to make it look like really glossy or really matte. There's a lot of different options to play around with in here. So I highly encourage you to just open this up and experiment with it in some way. Something else I wind up doing with this is throwing on a grunge texture. Now I'm just going to duplicate the panel and drop our grunge texture into that just so that it's clipped to the same size. Now you might wanna do different things in here like change it to a solid black and white if you're not after any of the color information that comes with it. And you might also wanna play with the curves so that you have more highlights available to you or even darker shadows. It's entirely up to you and depends on what style you're going for with your image. Finally, you can play around with a lot of different blending options over here. A popular one to use for something like this would be overlay or soft light even, sometimes multiply. These all have um, a lot of different effects depending on what you're doing and what image you're doing over it. I might set mine to color burn and you could even just play around with the opacity here if you wanted to. But something else that will give you even more control is using the blend options up the top right hand side here. This way we can actually play with this texture layer and remove the shadows completely. And you can sharpen this by bringing these values together, but you're gonna get some weird artifacts when you do that. 
We could also just drop the highlights completely. We can see that these highlighted areas are definitely adding to the texture, but let's say we didn't want those sort of lighter areas. Well, we can just take them out completely and be left with only the shadows, giving it a more sort of cracked look. Finally, we also have the underlying composition ranges. So this sort of determines how much of the shadow information or highlight information shines through from the bottom layer. You're gonna to wanna to play around with these depending on what image you're using them with. Finally, something else you might want to experiment with is I'm just going to drop in a random letter here and maybe we'll change the color to be like a sort of off white in a way. This might not be the best image to demonstrate this with, but we're gonna give it a go regardless. Before we do though, I'm going to group both of these together, press Control C on the group and open this in Affinity Photo. Great, so we've got all the layers from Affinity Designer and put it in Affinity Photo now. I'm going to select the letter A here and under Live Filters, we have an option here called Displace. Now, straight away, this isn't actually really gonna do anything. And that's because we need to lo load a displacement map. So you can create your own displacement maps, but we don't need to for what we're doing here. We're just gonna load a map from the layers beneath this. So we'll click that and we can see already that now we're getting some interesting texture information around the edge of this letter A. If we keep moving this up, we can see that it pretty much shifts the A in around our texture and sometimes into the gaps of our texture, which is a really, really cool effect. So if we just increase this just a little bit, great. From there, we might wanna duplicate this just so that we don't erase our original and we'll rasterize and trim that. And now we can go into our blending options again and just choose how much of the underlying composition we want to shine through in here. So yeah, again, not the most amazing example, but doing little things like this can really help incorporate different vector graphics onto the images that you're working with. Again, it's pretty low resolution and not perfect, but for example, if you ever want to apply like text painted to the side of a brick wall or something, this is definitely the way to go about it. You'll wind up seeing me use this displacement feature um, later on in this video when we get to the section where I try to emulate the page of a book. Now I just wanted to draw in some cables and make it look like something was patched up on here. This was relatively easy. Um, I pretty much just drew a path and then applied a 3D effect to it. Finally, I needed there to be a drop shadow so that these look like they were raised off of the panel slightly, but obviously a drop shadow just goes in one direction. So what I did is duplicated all of these cables and then converted them to shapes, merged those shapes into one shape and then changed the color to black, set the blend mode to multiply and just scaled it in slightly. Then I masked out that layer and just sort of erased areas where it became a little bit too close to where the jacks actually plugged in. And this just let me have a lot more creative control over how I wanted the shadow to be displayed. Now that the center panel was done, it was time to do the outside of the case. I found an old leather texture and I changed it to black and white and applied some 3D effects onto it. This usually protrudes out a little bit further than where the modules are plugged into. So I pretty much did the same thing that I did with the cables and made like an inner shadow myself. Then I played around with the color of the leather just a little bit to get it more in line with what I was using as a reference. And obviously given the fact that this is like that bumpy leather that you see on like most ant cases, I needed to roughen things up a little bit. I probably could have gone with a little bit more work in this department, but I just didn't want to go too crazy with it. So I essentially just drew a ton of different points around the outside and then just roughened them up slightly. And there we go. I pretty much had the title case completed. Now, before we go any further, I mean, let's just have a quick look at this thing. There's not really a whole lot going on. I mean, all we did was create a bunch of shapes, put some font on there and 
then just made a bunch of jacks and knobs and applied a bunch of different textures and played around with some shadow effects using things like the layer panel to do like drop shadows, outer glows, uh, inner shadows and the 3D effect especially is what's really helping this pop and come to life. It looks like there is so much more work put into this thing than what is really there. And that's something that I really love about using Affinity Designer is that it just gives me so many options that in the past I've found take me a long time to achieve, uh, but it's just so easy with like the click of a button in this thing for me to get the result that I'm after. So now it's time to make this thing uh, sort of blend in with like a real life scenario. I needed to choose a background, but I wanted it to be slightly out of focus. So I just found an interior stock footage and placed it in the back with a little bit of blurring added onto it. Then I needed the modular system to be set on a table. Originally, I actually found some stock footage of a table. I brought it into Affinity Photo and I used some of the fill functionality to remove some objects on there, but I wasn't really happy with like the overall resolution of the table against the modular as well. Like some of the edges weren't as sharp as I liked them. I played around with some color correction and I thought I'm probably gonna come back and fix that up later. Um, so I just skipped forward to uh, this little succulent that I'm going to have on the table next to the system. In the uh, synth community, it's kind of like um, become a bit of a meme at this point where uh, a lot of performers, like especially with modular, would always have like succulent plants placed around their system. Um, there was like this thing going around for a while saying it's obviously not a real synth video unless there's a succulent around the outside. And uh, yeah, so I just thought that it would be appropriate to place this in here. Now, obviously we want it to blend in with the color scheme of the interior room, the table and the modular itself. So after I mastered out in Affinity Photo, I played around with a lot of different photo techniques just to get more control over the whites and greens of the plant. Now I'm still working in Affinity Photo here um, and in case you haven't realized it yet, uh, yeah, you can just open up your Affinity Designer files in Affinity Photo and vice versa. Affinity Photo offers up a lot more in the photo editing department, whereas Affinity Designer offers up a lot more in, you know, the vector and pixel art perspective. So I've essentially just got a wood texture here and I'm skewing it and warping it and then sort of cutting out different sections to make my own table. And this way I've got a lot more control over how sharp the edge is, um, sort of the perspective of the wood grain itself. I'm using a drop shadow to make it look like um, the top of the table is hanging over the edge a little bit. And then I'm adding in rectangles and using different layer blending effects just to sort of have a bit more highlights on the side where the window is and the background and less highlights towards the front of the image. Just these sort of details really help sell everything. Um, it still looks illustrated, it still looks made up, but it also looks like it's a lot more believable once you've added all of these things in. So now I'm just going ahead and adding in a few other things like little LED lights because I felt like there was uh, not enough glowing stuff just on the front of these modules and a lot of modules have little glowing LED lights and whatnot. And then yeah, I pretty much just needed to um, draw in some extra black shapes underneath to make it look like this stuff was sitting on the table um, and had a bit more of a shadow. Finally, I wanted a lens flare effect. And while you can just get some stock imagery of a lens flare, um, I decided to use the Dream Photography brushes for Affinity from Felix Hernandez. Um, this is one of the add-ons that you can get for Affinity Photo. So I just downloaded that. Um, I think I used something similar in a previous version. And this basically allows you to use a pixel brush and just paint in in any color, um, lens flares and you know sun rays and all of that sort of stuff. And um, that's essentially what I did. I just plopped one down on top, changed the color and different blend modes. Just to have a look like a bit more light was creeping in in the back of that window. And adding this on top, I feel like it really helped blend the whole thing together like it was actually one believable scene. <laughs> 
Cool. So we basically just had the title down at this point. I felt like it was eye-catching enough or interesting enough to sort of kick the whole thing off. And now it's time to get into the more text heavy segments. So I copied my entire script into Affinity Designer. And this way I can just pretty much copy and paste different parts of the script into different size text boxes that I want as I go throughout the rest of the process. You can see me extending the wood grain further down at this point. And um, I'm not really too concerned about, you know, showing what's under the table or anything like that. It's time to switch gears now and pretty much design like an entirely new section of this infographic while still slightly tying it in with the others. Sometimes that can be a little bit difficult and it can be useful to create things like banners or other like obscuring objects sort of going across your infographic so that you can just plop in another random section underneath. But I found that just extending the wood grain down further here made it kind of look like we were on like a flatter surface now. Um, and I thought it would be just appropriate to show doing things like creating post-it notes and Polaroids uh, because they're really easy and fun to use. So you can see me drawing in some shapes here for a post-it note. I'm adding things in like drop shadows where like folds of paper go over the top and then just making sure that it's masked out and isn't appearing anywhere outside of the post-it note as well. Then I'm using the warp tool to sort of warp the text and make it look like it was handwritten onto this post-it note. Here you can sort of see me doing an edge highlight the old fashioned way of like I used to. Um, I'm using a path just to draw in like a very basic highlight. And this way I get a little bit more control of the thickness instead of using the 3D tool. And then I just place that around the edge. Now, obviously like posters don't exactly have highlights on the edges of them in real life, but again, little tiny details like this add up. If you just keep throwing stuff in like this around your scene, you're probably going to be a lot more pleased with the end result than if you were not to do it. Now I'm just essentially copying a bunch of stuff that I made for that first post -it note, changing the color and using that for the second body of text. And then down the bottom, I thought it'd be interesting just to try sort of making something look like it was written on a torn out sheet of paper from a notebook, but using the same handwritten font. So this is really fun, but easy to make as well. Um, essentially, it's just a box with like a bunch of circles cut out of it and some roughened edges. I drew on some margin lines and some uh, blue writing lines or whatever they're called. And then just to make it look a little bit more believable, I got a texture of some crumpled paper and then use some of the layer blending options just to make um, some of the highlights and shadows a bit softer in certain areas. You can see that I've used the 3D tool on this as well. Um, this has added on a little bit of a highlight and a shadow on either side. And it gives the illusion that this paper actually has a tiny bit of thickness to it rather than looking like a flat vector graphic. Obviously, I want this paper to be held in somewhere because we're using post-it notes above it. So you can see that I'm just making some round ball tacks to sort of pin this into place. Adding things like gradients to give them a glossy finish and um, duplicating those shapes and creating my own drop shadows with them, again, just sells the believability. Great, so we pretty much got all of the text of this section figured out. Now we need to make it a little bit more interesting and in line with like the work that we put into the title. So just like what I've done with the post-it notes, I'm going to include two stock images of modular synthesizers. Uh, one's a semi-modular, but hey, who cares? Uh, at the end of the day, it was actually quite difficult to find public domain imagery of um, modular synths. So this was the best that I could come up with. I'm essentially just putting them onto a Polaroid shape. Um, I'm making sure not to choose true white for the whiteness of these, but just a very soft gray. And we're applying some edge highlights onto them as well. And then we're just going to use the warp tool to sort of warp these into like a sort of bent out shape, much like the post-it notes are in. Again, we're gonna hold these into place with similar tacks and add on some drop shadows. <laughs> 
Cool. So we had like the main elements of this section completed now, but I still felt like it wasn't interesting enough. Um, it kind of just looked a little bit thrown on there. So I thought it'd be cool to take some patching cables and kind of wrap them in around the scene like they're snakes just sort of moving their way in and out of some of the different elements here. So I basically go ahead and use a bunch of different vector tools and gradients just to make the jack heads and then draw the jack cables the exact same way that I did on the title section. I'm using things like recolor, um, just to sort of change the color of these on the fly, just to sort of help speed up the workflow a little bit. And you can see me masking out certain areas just to make things sort of appear over other things and then go under other things. Great, and now we pretty much had the first section of our infographic completed. It wasn't the most interesting thing in the world to look at, but at least it had like a lot to look at and still some sort of useful legible information on there. Now I wanted to really switch gears with this second part and do something completely different in a, a almost completely different style. So I copied in the text and I thought given the fact that we're now on a wooden surface, let's just sort of break things up and make it look like we're looking into the page of an old book. I wanted this to almost appear like a comic book of sorts. Um, it's hard to show and I might be able to pull up a reference of it, but I've got an old book laying around my house called London is Stranger Than Fiction. Um, that book's got its own history and its own right and I just came across it at like a secondhand bookstore one day. But I thought that the illustrations were really cool. So I used that and a couple of other comic books I had laying around just to kind of like get an overall feel for the style that I wanted to go for. And and I decided to start hand drawing in some characters. So I switched to the pixel persona right now, and I'm just sort of drawing in a man who's patching something on his modular synthesizer. Then I brought in a photo of a popular Eurorack module that I'll use as a reference for something else later on. Now you can see that I'm using Frankentoon's Inks Pro up here. I get a lot of questions asking me about this brush and while I use it all the time it's mainly just because it's like the only brush I've got in my library where it's just simply tapered off and I never bothered to make my own one. You can make this yourself. Uh, you can just pretty much grab any brush you want, any basic brush and taper off the edges, make the middle a little bit wider and bam, there you go. So I'm drawing in the very basic black outlines and then you can see that I'm using the pencil tool with the fill mode activated just to start drawing in like a lot more shadowy areas. This can be a little bit hard to envision and I'm not doing like really big thick black shadows if I can help it because I want to use some half turning effects to sort of uh, fill in some of those myself later on. So speaking of half turning effects, I am using one of Frankentoon's packs right now, which is the Propaganda Art Pack. Um, he's got some fantastic packs on his website. I highly recommend you checking them out. Uh, some of these are paid, but this one in particular is just chocked full of so many great half turning effects. Now, again, you can switch to Affinity Photo. Affinity Photo actually has a half turning tool in there where you can create your own half tones. But a lot of these are sort of arranged in particular textures and designs that I really like. Um, I love using these. So yeah, I'm essentially dragging in some of those um, styles and different assets and then just sort of masking out different areas in the man that I want different half turning effects to be applied to just to sort of help sell that old illustration look. I experimented a lot with this until I found something that I liked. So I've got this module over to the left here and I did not intend to draw everything on this. I just basically wanted like a loose reference to sort of build something off of and I'm using some different half turning effects on this as well. So given the fact that this isn't a book, like a comic book, we're sort of going to keep illustrating this with like different comic book fonts and whatnot. And then we're sort of trying to show like a zoomed in bubble of something that he's seeing on his module down the bottom here. 
I want to interrupt again here and just talk a little bit about ways to accomplish different half turning effects, um, especially if you don't have access to something like Frankentoon's half turning pack, because yeah, you can actually get a lot of really useful results um, approaching this in different ways. So again, I'm just going to drop in a grunge texture. I'll just make this a little bit smaller. Doing this in a higher resolution could be good as well, um, but for now, I'm just going to do it in the document that I already had open. Back on our layers panel, we're going to use live filters and select half tone. Great, so we can see that we're getting a half tone effect instantly, but we need to drop our cell size. It can be hard to see what effect the half toning effect is having as well, unless you're zoomed in at 100%. If we open this back up, we can actually see that we've got a lot of different options here too. By default, the contrast is set to 85. If we increase this all the way, it removes most of the bottom part of the image that we had. But we can also drop this and just bring it straight back to where we started. You might also want to play around with the different dot styles that we have available here. You can switch to color as well, which is really cool if you're going for that old printed comic book effect using color. We also have line and a circular one as well. And keep in mind, I've just used this on like the standard image. So if we turn that off, something you might want to try first is changing this to solid black and white. And then just going to something like the levels panel and really trying to make this sort of as black and white as possible, leaving no middle ground gray information, but just having that sort of black on white. And now if we take our half tone effect outside of this image and just sort of apply it on top, we'll see that we're getting less gray information and more just the black and white style that we just made underneath. So yeah, again, it's really up to you how you go about making your half tone maps. I'm gonna group this duplicate it and rasterize it and just remove our bottom one. Now we can pretty much grab any shape that we want and we can drop our half tone effect inside of it. And now we can just move this around until we find the effect that we're after, which is really, really great, especially if you're using something like the pencil tool in Affinity Designer. You might find, however, if we just draw in basic panel and put this underneath that we're still getting a lot of the white information from this from this layer. So again, you might want to take this on top and we'll completely drop the highlights from this image so that we're just left with the black. One more time, you might want to rasterize this. And now if we drop it into our star and remove the color of our star, there we go. We just have this cool half tone effect living inside it that we can move around to suit whatever style of picture we're doing. I definitely encourage you to play around with this because given enough work, you can pretty much save a lot of these things as styles and then reincorporate it into any artwork you do from this point forward. Now I'm still trying to find like handwritten comic book fonts and um, sort of use them to start building out the actual comic book panels. You can see that the module is like almost popping out of the panel, which is something that a lot of comic books like to do when they emphasize something. I probably wouldn't have thought of doing something like that if I wasn't using comic book reference material. And I think this is why using a reference can sometimes be really important when you're trying to emulate something because it's just gonna help show a lot of things that you otherwise might not consider. Underneath this, um, I just wanted to show like a very basic signal chain for what a modular synth is sort of made up of. And uh, any eagle-eyed viewers out there that know anything about modular will probably notice that I've got a VCA and envelope um, kind of back the front. Those arrows should be going the other way, um, but it doesn't really matter too much for what we're doing here today. Then you can see me sort of experimenting with the different angles of this, and now I'm starting to draw in the page.
I found another type of um, page texture here. And you can see that um, because I made up the shape of the module out of an actual white color, now that I'm doing the color correction, it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. Um, so I just go into the layer blend options and completely drop all of the highlights from this image um, and make them transparent. And it just sort of allows me to blend this in on top of the page in a more seamless way. I'm not going true black for this uh, because I want it to sort of emulate um, like an older sort of ink that might have been used on this page. And now I'm adding things in like gradients and whatnot just to sell the fact that there's a seam on a page. Just for this next example, I'm just going to use a random shape here. We'll remove the fill and up the stroke width. And I'm just going to duplicate that, make it a little bit smaller. And we'll cut a hole out from the front. So now this is just one object. If we were to give it a fill color, for example, this is what we'd be seeing. Let's say, for example, I give this a white fill color. I'm now going to copy this over to Affinity Photo. Just going to drop in a paper texture and we might make it just a little bit smaller. And we'll paste our shape in on top. Great. So yeah, just following the same book example that I did before. Yes, I had the half turning effects and everything. Essentially, we've got a image here. I'm just gonna duplicate it so we don't lose our original and we'll rasterize and trim this. Now we can go into the blending options and let's just remove all of the highlights from this. Like so. So now we're just left with the black parts of the image. Again, you're going to want to rasterize and trim this if you plan on using the displacement feature afterwards. I'm just going to drag it down a layer and select displace. And then we'll choose load map from layers beneath. And yeah, playing with this, we can sort of follow the texture of the paper just a little bit, just to sort of increase that roughness. Again, you don't want to do it too much but now it looks like this has been printed onto the texture of this paper. It's a little fuzzy, but it gets the job done. Now we're happy with that. I'm going to rasterize this, go to our blending options, and yeah, drop the highlights. Finally, uh, there's no ink out there that's true black, or at least um, it's not very common. So we wanna go into our adjustments and you could use anything, but for example, we'll use curves, select the blue channel and just increase our shadows a little bit so that it's blue. There we go. So now we're getting some sort of nice blue ink. And then finally, we probably want to go into our blending options one more time and let some of this texture shine through just a little bit as if the ink didn't fill in all the gaps. Maybe something like that. It's entirely up to you and what you're going for. And there we go. Something like this can give a much more believable look than just slapping on a plain vector graphic and dropping the opacity slightly. Now, obviously, given that this is going to be in a book, like we'll put down the book binding, um, but I'm actually going to use the warp feature uh, just to slightly warp this entire image and make it look like the page is um, sort of bowed in the middle. And there we go. We've pretty much got uh, the first two sections of our infographic done now. And um, this section that we just finished now with the book is in a completely different style. And that's what I mean. Like you don't always have to make things look like they've got any form of continuity with this stuff. You can just simply throw in a very straight line that's going to help break it up and help viewers understand that, oh, okay, I'm actually reading about a different section in here now. It's important to like group your text into the section that you think they're relevant to. Um, so obviously those first few paragraphs all went together and now we've moved on to something else We're in the book. And now we're gonna move on to the last section, which is the different formats of modular synthesis. Um, they can all appear as one big section as well. Now I knew straight away uh, for this last section that I was going to have to approach it kind of differently to the first two, just because it is so much more text heavy. I've essentially created a list here, a list of different modular formats. So we've got a small introduction to this list and then the list follows. Given the fact that it's so text heavy, I didn't really want to include 
too many illustrations like we had done in the first two sections um, because otherwise the text would just go on and on forever. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to do like a main illustration of each of these formats at the top much like we've done in the title section. Um, and we could use that to show like the general scale of each of these modular systems and how they appear next to one another. And then somehow connect those images to the relevant list item underneath. So again, I'm kind of using very basic shapes to block sections out here. Um, originally, I was gonna have everything shifted over to the right hand side. But you'll see later on that, yeah, I didn't go for that. And I decided to move everything back to the center. There was a lot of trial and error involved in this. And I didn't want to start drawing the modules until I pretty much had the basic layout of everything I wanted to go for. I needed to pick a really appropriate font too, just to sort of help separate the list items from all of the other text that was appearing in the section. And you can see that I've used colored lines to sort of link up like different modular systems to their list item. I want these modular systems to look like they're appearing all on a shelf, sort of stacked on a studio shelf somewhere. So I go about uh, using some wood grain texture and making some shelf brackets out of vector shapes and little screws and whatnot, just to sort of help the believability in that. Next up, I've just dropped in a random stock image of a wall at the moment, just to sort of help me get an understanding for how all of this could turn out. I knew that I'm probably gonna to have to have some backing on these list items, which is why I put them in colored boxes, just to sort of make it a little bit easier to be like, okay, I'm looking at the purple section here. That must mean I'm looking at the purple modular system uh, sitting on the shelf up above. I thought it would be a lot more clearer if I added out of glows to each of these colored lines and shapes as well. So you can see me doing that now. Cool. So now it was pretty much time to go through the painstaking task of creating each of these modular systems. Fortunately, we'd already created a modular system for the title. So I was able to reuse a lot of the same assets from that uh, when I was building the Eurorack section. However, some of the other systems look quite different to Eurorack. Um, so I had to make stuff from scratch for that. You can see that I've got a reference image over to the side just to help me get an understanding of the scale and look and design of some of these modules for these different systems as well. Given the fact that this section is so much smaller than the introduction, I didn't need this to look as detailed or as realistic. Like, yes, I'm still doing 3D effects and drop shadows and whatnot, um, but there's a lot less care taken here because these are sort of meant to be almost like um, icons as or, or visual representations of these systems rather than truly realistic photos. After I did the Eurag rack one, I started working on AE Modular. Fortunately, I had one of those systems sitting next to me, um, so I could use that as reference. But again, I needed to keep things kind of basic. Didn't want to go too heavy or be too accurate with it. I just wanted it to look like you could look at this and say, oh, that's AE Modular and that's Eurorack and that's Dotfor and so on and so forth. This was definitely a time consuming process because I wanted things to look good. I didn't really want it to look like half baked in any sort of way. And I actually found that I had a lot of fun doing it for some reason, because I think it's just, you know, a lot of arranging shapes and trying out different effects to make things look cool. There's not really too much else to say about the design of this part. So I'll probably just keep the time lapse going. I also use things like drop shadows just to sort of separate each system from the other and make it look like the front ones were casting shadows on the ones on the back. And then I thought it would be interesting to sort of incorporate uh, like a glowing title into each one of these boxes as well. So I just played around with a different font and um, used some external glow effects. And uh, yeah, I was pretty happy with the way that this section was coming together at this point. The only thing I wasn't happy with was the background. Uh, I didn't really like that white plaster wall. So I decided to bring in some stock imagery of something else just to play around with. I thought it'd be interesting to maybe try like an old brick wall 
I definitely could have designed something like this myself, uh, but at this point I'd already spent a lot of time on this infographic and I felt like it was pretty much time to finish up. You can see me experimenting in an affinity photo, um, trying out things like the uh, live dust and scratches effect and um, median blurs and whatnot, just to sort of decrease some of the detail in the bricks uh, because I knew I'd be adding like a lot of high pass details myself later on. But yeah, essentially we'd ended up uh, with a completed infographic and now it was time to do all of the color correction and all of the fun little things I like to do to help bring illustrations like this to life and really make them pop out. This looks okay right now, but what I'm also seeing is that it looks dull and inconsistent uh, doesn't particularly have a strong color theme. It's just a lot of different colors all over the place. And I usually like to address that after I've gone through all of the creative process. This is my way of doing things. So the first thing I like to do is apply a lens filter just to sort of help add a little bit more warmth to the illustration. And then I use color balance to add a little bit more warmth to the highlights, but also make the shadows a lot cooler. You can see that I'm using curves here just to play around with the contrast slightly as well. And then once I'm satisfied with the way everything sort of looks there, I like to create circular shapes to help accentuate certain colors in specific areas. This is actually a pretty rough way of doing things, um, but I've been doing it for a long time now and I really like the effect that it gives, which is essentially creating a radial gradient effect um, using reds or blues and purples, um, sometimes greens, but not often. And then I'll position that over certain sections. Like here, you can see that over one of the Polaroids, I put a red effect and over the other, I've put a more blue effect. And using things like the color dodge effect, uh, sometimes overlay or screen as well, but usually color dodge, um, you can get some really interesting results. Now, as you work through doing this, you'll probably find that it is a bit much like it can be, it can add like way too much color information to your image, but that's okay because what you do afterwards is group everything together and then play around with either masks or different forms of opacity just to sort of help dodge it back a little bit um, because we're gonna be adding like a lot of different adjustment effects onto this. So it's important to apply them all strongly first, then decrease them until they are super, super subtle. And then once you layer those subtle effects up on top of one another with all of the other effects that you'll be applying, you'll actually find that there's a drastic change to the color correction that you're applying to this image. So here's a little bit of a look at the final result of adding on just some of the color. It's really colored things up. And I find that the sort of offset of like bluey purple areas to the warmer yellowy areas um, just sort of make it look a lot more interesting. Now I've exported the entire thing so that it is one flattened image and I've brought it back into Affinity Photo for a little bit of last minute detail refinement. The first thing you'll see me do here is apply a high pass filter, which uh, is one way of really putting a lot more of an accent on details. And this is where, uh, when I was saying earlier about incorporating things like the lens effects using the 3D effects and drop shadows and whatnot, once you apply high pass filter to that stuff, you can see that this 3D effect is really popping on a lot of these elements. And we're gonna now make it pop even more using this high pass effect. So we just wanna apply it subtly. We don't want it to be too overbearing. And then what I usually like to do is set the blend mode to something either overlay, soft light or hard light. Um, whichever one gives the desired result that I'm after. In this case, I went with highlight and I find that it's really evident on like the scan lines and the texture on the panel with the letter A on it. If you want more creative control over how this looks, you don't have to high pass the entire thing either. You can just high pass different sections at a time and sort of give each section its own high pass strength. Sort of uh, depends on whatever artwork you've gone with when making this. Now this part's completely optional, but I really like the effect that this gives off. And it's it's kind of quite similar to high pass in a way, um, just a little bit grungier. So I've uh, now with the high pass layer on, I've flattened this image and I'm going to open up the tone mapping persona. 
I like to switch to the James Wriston Customs defaults down the bottom. And in here, you'll find like a lot of really cool grungy effects. These are a good way to sort of get started with like a jumping off point. Um, you can see that I've selected the bottom one here. And then I just like to zoom in and play around with things like the local contrast and tonal compression, the black point uh, exposure and whatnot. And you can see that this drastically changes the amount of detail we're able to sort of pull from the image. Like, yes, it's in black and white, um, but I find that is really useful for just sort of seeing what's going on. And we're going to use a blend mode to apply this later on. So yeah, playing around with a lot of these effects, I'm trying to make everything look a lot grungier, like all of the shadows are really popping, but all of the highlights are really popping as well. And then we bring that on, on top of our original image. And again, we're going to set it to hard light and then play around with the blending options on our layer, just to sort of knock different parts back from the shadows and knock different parts back from the highlights. We don't want it to be too overbearing. We just want it to be slightly visible. Doing this can add so much more grunge and little bits of noisy detail to your image. Um, it, you can definitely overdo it, but I highly encourage you to experiment with this. Don't forget to also just play around with the opacity of this layer as well until you're pretty much satisfied with the result. Finally, for the final step, I like to add noise to my image. Noise is a weird thing. Yeah, it can really help things just look a lot more realistic. But just keep in mind that when you're using the noise filter in Affinity Photo, you can't actually see how the exported result is going to look until you've zoomed into 100%. So if you zoom all the way out and add noise, your image might look extremely noisy and then you export it it might not look that noisy at all. So if you want a good idea of the amount of noise you're applying, make sure that you are zoomed in to 100% using the zoom tool. And then you should be able to get a clearer idea of just how much noise you're applying. Again, you can definitely overdo this. I just sort of like to do things kind of subtly at about like 10 to 15%. And then yeah, we had essentially completed the infographic. So it was time to export now, and I'll just bring up a few chunks of the end result because it is quite a long image. I'll just sort of zoom into each section so you can get a better look. Okay, so wrapping things up, I just wanna quickly go over probably the most important stage of any project that you do like this, and that is critical reflection. Identifying areas that you went wrong and areas that could be improved on in your next project. And don't just take your own word for it. You should post things like this to the internet or show your friends and family and get their opinions on things too. Ultimately, this sort of stuff is gonna be seen by other people. So you need to know what works and what doesn't. I'm going to quickly point out things I don't particularly like about my own project here, but also feel free to leave me a comment down below and uh, let me know what you think about the whole thing as well. For example, as much as I love this title, I do think that it is a little bit difficult to read. I have to wonder that if you didn't know that this infographic is about modular synthesis, would you be able to decipher this title? I have no idea because I spent so long looking at it and I already know what it says. I think it's cool and eye-catching, but it just might not be eye-catching enough for a viewer that's looking for information on modular synthesis. This next section I feel is a little loosely put together and kind of bland compared to the rest of the illustration. I think it's cool that I managed to get the cables sort of wrapped around, um, but having things pinned up like this, I'm not sure it works entirely. It might have been even neater to have like a hobby cutting board under here with maybe even like a Stanley knife or some more detail. I definitely think that the text could be more legible. For example, it's already hard to read the word modular synthesis up here. And then down the bottom, I'm covering up the start of modular. Something else I've noticed about this is that when I use the warp tool, I've got this aliased edge as a result. I haven't experimented with this too much and it might even come down to being my own fault. Perhaps I should have rasterized this first or perhaps I should have just warped the image and done a flat vector graphic for the edge of the Polaroid so that it stayed as sharp as the post-it note over here. As for this piece of paper, I really like how the top and sides came together with like all of this tiny little edge highlight and 3D detail. But I think the bottom part looks pretty sloppy and um, it doesn't look like it was torn off. I think if I maybe used a stock image or some torn off paper, 
or created one myself, it would have looked a lot more realistic. It probably could have done with some additional detail around the holes where this is poking through the paper as well. As for the book section, I feel like because this text is aligned so nicely, um, I probably should have done the same with this text. I don't like that there are black areas either side of the second line here. While I'm happy with this illustration, there are a couple of other issues with it as well. For example, how this pops over the top of the text box, but you can't actually see the top of the module. Just the front plate is doing that. Further down, we can actually see that the line goes through the module here. And while this could work because a lot of old comic books had weird janky issues like this, it's something that I'd want to watch out for if I were attempting it again. Also, I do like how I've got this bubble sort of pointing to his modular system, but as soon as it hits this black wall here, it kind of gets lost in the detail. I think I should have just cut a little bit more out of the shape of this black background behind the man, just so that that was a little bit more visible. I quite like how this area came together. It's pretty simple and doesn't need to be any more detailed than it already is. But like I said earlier, I accidentally got VCA and envelope around the wrong way. This might not really be a big issue for what I'm doing here today, but if you're doing this for another company and let's say you're creating an infographic on automotive stuff or workplace health and safety, you're going to want to double check or triple check your information and make sure that it's correct before putting it out there into the world. The last thing you want to do with an infographic is provide people with false information. Finally, I definitely found the final part of this infographic quite challenging just because of how wordy it is. I know that I have these racks sitting up here on a shelf, but I don't think that it's portrayed very clearly. This wooden box with these two brackets could mean anything, and I'm not sure if it really looks like a shelf at the end of the day. What I probably could have experimented with is creating several shelves and putting the text and different formats on their own shelves and just sort of making it look like a stack of shelves going up a wall. And then I could have experimented with throwing in some more plants and books and other cool items just to make this look a little bit more realistic and less like what the heck am I looking at? Finally, I'm not really happy with this stock image of the wall that I wound up using. I did use a couple of effects and you can probably see when you zoom in, it's got this strange pattern on it from using dust and scratches and um, the different high pass effects. But at the end of the day, it just looks like a boring image of a brick wall. I probably should have either designed one myself or taken better care in choosing a stock image. For example, I can see that this image is curved, like there was a warp in the lens and I didn't really identify that before I put it in there and it bothers me every time I look at it. Finally, one other thing that annoys me about this image and I'm probably going to be the only one that notices it, but it is good to keep in mind and I'll definitely be practicing ways to get around this. But the lines that are connecting these together, you can see that it's just a line on top of a line and these aren't actually connected or joined in any way. The same goes for up here. We can see that the blue is just sort of sitting on top and there's a little seam here. It's not so evident on the green or the red or the pink, but it definitely is on the blue. And it's really important to look out for sloppy mistakes like that because if you're making them all the time, then um, your image might suffer because of it. Finally, while I think that this is okay for infographics to do, I don't think that there is a consistent enough style or color theme going on. I know that we have a lot of color in this top section, but it's also very warm and homey. And the second section sort of follows that. As soon as we hit the book though, we're pretty much robbed of all of that awesome color stuff. It's a good breaking point, but it just, you know, it's a completely different style. And again, while that's totally fine to do in an infographic, I was really liking this warm homey look that I had going on for the first half of this. And then all of a sudden it just switches to plain old black and white for a book and then goes into like neon club territory and just looks like something completely different by the end. I mean, in other cases, I've actually worked my hardest to achieve that very effect with infographics. But for this one, I just feel like it didn't really pan out. Finally, one other thing I forgot to mention. I showed this to a buddy of mine and I didn't realize at the time, but my infographic is rife with spelling mistakes and grammatical errors. For example, the second statement should read other modules instead of these modules because we're referring to something else down here as opposed to what we started with in the first sentence. In the Eurorack section, I actually messed up the spelling and spelt dot for wrong. There is no T in his last name. 
In the Moog section, this should read that Moog officially ceased production of this system, not on this system. And there also doesn't need to be a comma after however. Another point is that for Serge, I said that he was a French composer. Now I did read that on a website, but again, this just goes to show that you should really check your sources because as my friend Carsten pointed out, he was actually Russian American. Finally, in the abused electronics section, which is the system I own, I actually spelt Langer's name wrong. Down here, I put Langer's and it's actually Robert Langer, which I've spelt correctly up here. Also, when I first exported this, I'd actually forgotten to include the T in Robert. So yeah, thank you to my mate Carsten for pointing all of these mistakes out to me. He knows a lot more about modular synthesis than I do, so he was able to pick up on a lot of those other things as well. Anyways, as I said, let me know down below in the comments what you guys think of this. Do you have any constructive criticism you want to give me? I'll gladly take it on board. Anyways, that's pretty much it for me today, everybody. I hope that you got a lot out of this tutorial. I know that it might not have been up everybody's alley, but I urge you to go online and just have a look at the various examples of infographics that are out there and see if you can come up with something that's unique to your tastes and interests. Try and push yourself, experiment with a style you've never experimented with before and just try out new things. You might be really surprised with what you come up with. Hit the like if you like, and if you don't, tell me why. Please subscribe to this affinity channel and also my channels. Check me out on Patreon and thanks. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one.